A lot of people want to run Clipper firmware, but they want to hang on to their old school LCD screen. You can do that, and I'll show you how to get it configured. Hello everyone, Chris here. We've got our MKS Skipper board installed on our SK Go. It is up and printing, but we're starting to look at some of the additional features we might want to implement on our 3D printer just to make our life a little easier. We've already looked at filament runout, and today we're going to look at adding an old school LCD screen to the printer just so we can get a quick status and interact with the machine rather than having to pull out the phone or go to the computer to look at something like mainsail or fluid. Now Clipper does support a lot of these old school screens, but not all the pinouts are the same. It's been a while since the wrap wrap style screen was created and the boards don't necessarily mirror that same configuration or you might be using a different style cable and you do have to get the pin set up correctly in your configuration file to make all of this work. So that's what we're going to run through today. So we'll take a look at a couple screens, we'll get them configured in Clipper in your printer.cfg and then hopefully this will give you the added features that you want on your printer just for convenience sake. So let's get into it. So here's a couple of quick examples of screens that you'll see on old school printers. These are some of the original style. This is what we call a 2004, so 20 by 4 lines here. This is the one from LDO, but you can see it has a pinout of all the different pins here and how they connect up. So this is very helpful, but not a lot of the screens have this. The screen we're going to be focused on today is this 12864, so 128 by 64. It does not have a pinout. It has the same style connector. You usually see EXP1, EXP2, and we have those same headers on the board, but they're not necessarily pinned out the same. And these are the kind of cables that we're used to using. I always mark mine one and two on both sides just so it's easy to figure out. But they have that key or the blade there on top. And then you have a red line to symbolize your five volt. Both ends of these cables should be identical. You have the key on one side and then that red line should be the same all the way through. And here's a view of our MKS skipper board. We do have an EXP one and two, just like the screen. And you notice that key is facing down. But the pinout is not necessarily the same as the screens would be. Now this isn't the best method to figure things out by any means. But it usually works for me. It's fairly quick to figure out what's going on here. So I'm just going to take my cable and plug into EXP1 and plug into EXP2. Now I don't expect my screen to work because it hasn't been configured inside Clipper. But if I plug it in, I should at least get it to power up. EXP1 is really the most important one in this configuration because that's where the voltage should be that will light up the screen. So we'll just start by plugging that one in. So we're plugged in in the stock configuration and you can see we don't have anything. If we plug in cable two, no help there either. So that's a great indication that the board and the screen are not pinned out the same. So here's a great example of the old school rep wrap screens. The 2004 and the 12864 should be pinned out the same for the most part. Always check with the manufacturer, but these are intended to plug into one of those old school ramps headers. The pins that we're most interested in here are the five volt and the ground on EXP1. They're all important, but we want to make sure that at least we're getting power to the screen. So this is a good example, but then let's go ahead and take a look at the pinout on our skipper board. Here's the skipper. You saw those EXP1, EXP2 plugs that I showed you before. They're down here. And then up here is the pinout. You can see on EXP1, they actually have five volt in this pin down here. And two, we have 3.3 volts available down here on this pin. So it's actually flip-flopped from what our screen would be. But it's only upside down because of how the cable is keyed. You can see the key in the diagram down here. The five volt and ground pins are where they should be. Remember, this is the rep wrap diagram. It's just off 180, just because of that plastic shroud. So on the board side, when the cable is keyed correctly, the key is down, and then we have that red wire on the five volt side. So five volt on EXP1, five volt and ground on this end, and then 3.3 on this one. 
Not all boards have that, but this one does. So I would prefer to have the red line in the correct position. So the board side, we are good. On this particular screen, you can see that red line where we now know 5 volt and 3.3 is coming in. It's actually on the opposite side of where this screen is pinned out. Going back to that diagram, you can see traditionally there's the key. It's the same on this PCB, but 5 volt is going to be up here. And correcting this on the screen side is the easiest thing to do. Remember, not every screen is going to be the same, but this one is off. So what I like to do is just pull the cables, and we've confirmed the voltage pins are correct. They are aligned. They're just 180 off. The data pins, we can move them around. We could change that in the configuration. Can't do much about voltage. So the easiest fix, if you have this issue, I just pull this plastic shroud off. Some screens don't even have this shroud. Just pull it off both sides and flip them 180 and put them right back on. And now that they're flipped, we can go ahead and plug our cables back in, EXP1 to EXP1, EXP2 to EXP2. And at least now it lights up. Our data is mangled because we need to configure the board for this. But now we at least know that we have the power correct and we can continue on with our configuration. So that's really all you need to do with the hardware portion if you have this type of board where you have the headers available for an LCD screen like EXP1 or 2. But there's all kinds of different manufacturers, all kinds of different screens, and I've seen multiple different types of configurations. LDO does it a little bit differently than some of the other ones do, but this is probably 90% of the time, if you're having an issue, this is what it is. You probably just need to flip it 180. Now be careful because you can mess things up. You don't want to plug in pins where they don't belong because that might ruin either your board or your screen or both. So check the pin out before you do something like this, but most of the time this will get you up and running. But now we need to configure it. So let's get to that. Back to our dashboard and we're going to head into printer.cfg so that we can assign some pins for the output of that screen. So we'll scroll down a bit. Now, if you're using that default configuration like we use when we built our MKS skipper board config, they've already got some pins out here that have been aliased. Basically, it's the board pin assigned to an EXP friendly pin. So you can see PB2 here is assigned EXP11. It's supposed to make it easier for you to understand. But there's example configurations available in Clipper if you don't have this style of screen. But let me show you what this alias means. So we've got all of these aliased out so we can call them by this exp1-1 name. If we go to our skipper pinout, you can see that PB2 pin is right here. So they're calling that pin 1. PB2, exp1-1. On the other side, exp1-10. That's this pin down here. So basically, left to right, one, two, three, four, and so on. Same thing with EXP2. They've got PA6, and then that 3.3 volt. So same thing, EXP2, one, two, three, four, down to 10. So that's how they laid it out in the config file. So good on them for at least getting us up and running, renaming the pins so it's more friendly for us to configure. And you can see in the comments, they're talking about sample-lcd.cfg. That's the sample configuration that's given in the Clipper config. It should be in your config directory. If you're used to pulling examples for printer configs, it's in there. But you can also search for it on the net. It's out here in the GitHub, and it gives you examples of different types of displays and how to configure them. Again, we're working with the RepRap discount. 12864 full graphics. So this is the config that we would start with. This is the one we want to use. But you've got the 2004 like I showed you. And you have the CR10 Ender 3 style, the one that has the EXP3 plug, just the single plug, no SD card reader. So you'd start with this base. You've got the Mini 12 12864. There's several things in here you can do. Hopefully they have the screen for you and you don't have to fish around with a lot of different configurations. You can see there's even a note down here 
what we talked about. A lot of the pinouts have that cutout in the wrong location, so they're flipped. So it's a pretty common thing to see, but you should know how to get around that by now. So back to printer.cfg. What we need to configure is the display section. So we need to start display in brackets, tell it what type of LCD screen we're going to configure. This is the chip ST7920. Again, that's for that 12864 RepRap full graphics display. And then in that example, these pins, your check pin, your clock pin, all the SPI pins you need to make that screen work, this is what the screen is expecting. So your encoder pins, your click pin, how you use the wheel, this is what it's going to take to get that screen up and running. This is assuming you have that cable correct. Most of the time, if you have it flipped, you're going to have it correct. That's why they built this chart up here to give you the specific pins on the board that your EXP screen, those screen pins, would expect. Because those assignments aren't necessarily going to be the same. How that 10 pin cable is configured is going to be the same. So just start with that default configuration. The one from the config file, this is exactly what is in my config right here. So just copy and paste that in. Then we can build the map that tells the board where these pins are. And that's what MKS has already done for us up here. But you would just assign some board pins and mark it as alias. So it knows when this display configuration down here calls for EXP11, it ties to PB2. Back to our pinout, there's PB2. And they do have some rough entries of what these pins do, like PE9, PE8, those are your encoder pins. So left and right on that click wheel, and you have a detect pin for your SD card, clock pins, all the things you need to make SPI work. But it's much easier to build this alias panel to tell it where those pins are and just let that screen display assume what it thinks is there. So let's take another kind of board just for an example. Since MKS has already done the work here, I can put this in a different config or in a file and leave it in the description so you can copy and paste as needed. Here's the pinout for the Big Tree Tech Octopus board. You can say it has EXP1 and EXP2. We just take this layout and convert it over to our config file if this is the board we were using. Since these screens are pretty generic, you can always take into account your 5 volt and ground pin and then build your layout from there. So we'll call these 9 and 10. And this PE8, PE7 will be 1 and 2. So for the octopus, you would just update these values. 1 would be PE8. 2 would be PE7. And so on. So you just want this alias to match the board pinout. And then you should be able to use those default settings to get that screen up and running. It's not very hard. You just have to know where to look to get all of this updated because no two boards are the same. But all the screens are pretty generic, so you have that going for you. So that's what makes this alias section nice. This keeps your hands clean. You don't have to put the pins down here, the specific board pins that this expects. It's always going to be the same for that particular type of screen. You can just alias it out up here. Hopefully I explained that correctly. It might not make a lot of sense for folks, but it's going to make your life easier, trust me. So, when your alias is correct, you've got all your pins moved over, and you've got your display configured down here. This is your output beeper pin. You can add that in there or not. It is very annoying, I'll show you, but that's up to you. But this is the base. This is all you need to get that screen up and running. So, we'll save and restart. And wait for it, there's the beep. Yes, very annoying. But at least we know the configuration has recognized the screen. And Fluid isn't kicking out any errors. Clipper is really good about that if we mess something up in the config. And here's our old school screen ready to go. 
Now, it looks a lot like every other screen you've ever used on a printer. The config layout's a lot the same. You've got options where you can control your host. You've got your SD card, the files that are on here. You've got control. All of this works just like it would in the front end, like a mainsail or fluid. Temperature, filament, even some setup options. Other than just the regular stuff, what temperature is it? Is it printing? But I will tell you, if you go into SD and then you get your G code, you can see just clicking on that kicked off the print if you go back to fluid. But you'll notice none of the temperatures or anything like that are rising. And that's just because of how it works. This is an SPI interface trying to interact with that Linux interface. So you have to do just a little bit more to get that going. You'll notice back on the status screen, nothing's happening. If you go back to SD card and hit start printing, now you can go back to the status screen and see things that start to move. Same way here in Fluid. Now it's starting to initialize the heat up and it'll start printing. That's because that G code file actually lives on a file system in Linux, not on the SD card on your screen. And that's one of the major drawbacks and probably letdowns for people that want to use their screen is this SD card here is now useless. We can just pull it out and you go to SD card. You can see that Benchy file is there. It's reading what is available on the Linux configuration. Just for example, we go back to fluid. We'll head over to jobs and upload another file. We'll just upload this test G code I have. It's now in the job queue. Back to the screen before we just had that Benchy fixed. We'll back out. SD card. Now we have our test G code. So we're not actually reading the SD card on this screen. We're not supporting it. We're just pulling in what's available in Fluid. Hence, you click it to load it into Fluid. Once you've clicked it, it's loaded, and then you can start the print. And the print is in progress. One other thing to mention is the kill pin down here. Remember, you can use that on the old school machines. We've got it commented out on our config, and that's probably for good reason. You probably don't want to try to send a kill pin to one of these boards. I'm not sure if it reboots the host or what it might actually do, but you don't want to just reboot your Linux install or one of these boards randomly. This might have pretty ill effects. So I recommend just leaving that commented out and not utilizing it for your Clipper install. So there you go. You can add your old school LCD screen to your 3D printer that's now running Clipper. Now, it might not be as useful as the screen once was in different versions of firmware, but at least you can get a quick status of the temperatures and what the printer might be doing. There are a handful of things that you can get around on. At least you can home, move axes, things like that. Now, most of the printers that I'm rolling over to Clipper, they already have one of these screens on them. And a lot of the boards support EXP1 and 2 connections, so why not go ahead and plug it in and get it set up? All you have to do is get the pins file for your board, make sure they're aliased correctly to use one of these screens. There's a couple of different examples out there for you to choose from, and you should be all set. And if you're going someplace and you want to use your Clipper 3D printer and you might not have a network available, you could just load up your G-code files and at least you could kick them off or stop them with your screen right there at the printer. You don't have to mess around with all that connectivity to try to control it. So that might be helpful as well. So that is it for today. Hopefully you found this helpful and I'll see you really soon on the next one.